This lecture focuses on this oil on canvas. Its title is Virgin of Montserrat. It was painted in 1693. So therefore we are speaking about colonial Latin American art. And it was painted by Francisco Chivantito, an artist of indigenous descent. He was uh, an Inca, a, a person who was born in the Andes of indigenous descent. And he was born in Chincheros. The three main themes that I like to discuss, cover in this lecture will be number one, the painting itself, the various aspects, the composition, as well as the iconography of this painting. We're going to talk about precedence, what seems to be Spanish or Catholic in origin, and what seems to be Andean or Inca in, in, in origin. And last, we're going to talk about a very important topic in this field, which is what makes Latin American art hybrid and why that is so complex. There's various words to, to use to describe colonial Latin American art, mestizo, there's words like convergence and confluence, and uh, all of these terms are very politically charged because it evokes issues of colonialism, the subaltern, subversiveness, subversiveness, etc. So we're going to discuss the complexity of the term and why it's problematic in the context of studying Latin American art. So let's begin by showing you where Chincheros is. Chincheros is in this region of Peru, like I said, and very near Cusco. It's about 17 kilometers from Cusco. So let's begin. If you go to the town of Chincheros today, in the year 2020, you will find that the Virgin of Montserrat painting inside this church, which you enter from this central arch over here, this is the main door, and you will find the painting in the church's nave, which is the main region where the congregants go to church and that's where they pray or listen to mass or worship. Now, Chivantitos, Virgin of Montserrat's painting may seem at first glance to be entirely Spanish or Catholic. And in part, that, that would be true. And in fact, I'd like to begin by describing the origin to the cult to the Virgin of Montserrat, which began in Catalonia. Catalonia is a region in Spain, very near the border with France and the country of Andorra. And it began with a, with a shrine. Now, Marian shrines are very popular. There's various Marian shrines throughout the world. And they are associated with a particular apparition or a miracle that the Virgin made. And often it includes pilgrimages to this site to pray to, to the Virgin Mary. And this cult began in Catalonia in the 11th century. And now, uh, uh, and now it's become an abbey, which is a complex of buildings, as you can see in this photograph of modern day, um, of, of the modern day uh, abbey. And her image is inside of this uh, church. And the, as you can see the landscape also, so I'd like to draw attention to the fact that here's the shrine and there's a, a whole complex of buildings, most of them, uh, most of these buildings were completed in the 19th and 20th century. But I'd like to call attention to the fact that, see if you can focus on the fact that the landscape is echoed in Chivantito's painting. Now here's an image of the, uh, of the Virgin of Montserrat, also known as the Black Madonna or La Moreneta in the uh, regional language. It's not Spanish, by the way. Um, and then this sculpture is in wood that you can see here. You can see that she's behind, she's within a vitrine, which is a glass showcase. And you can see over here very well that her hand and the globe that symbolizes the world or the universe is actually protruding from the glass vitrine. And uh, people who engage in the pilgrimage come on over and either kiss or touch her hand while waving to the baby Jesus. And uh, that 
that that is what uh, the pilgrimage involves. That's what um, the faithful would want to do. So among the the themes that are part of the iconography would be the Virgin Mary sitting with the child Christ on her lap. Both of them, each of them hold a globe in in one of their hands. In here, uh, the Virgin Mary is holding it with her uh, left hand and the baby Jesus is holding it with his right hand. And also there is much association with sewing or the saw. In, because in Latin, Montserrat, the town where this abbey is and the shrine to the Marian shrine is, means sod mountain. And the other uh, miracle that happened in around the 14th century is that someone heard music coming out of a cave or a mountain in, in Montserrat. And now the abbey, the church, and the, the shrine is very much associated with uh, Escolania, which is the boys' choir or boys' ensemble in which it, boys it, sing or play instruments in devotion to the Virgin of Montserrat. Now let's take a closer look at the painting itself, in particular the composition and the iconography itself. In the iconography, we see that the main figure is at the center, and that is the Virgin Mary holding the child Christ. And the main theme is a cor her coronation. And we see that there is God the Father at the very top, hovering above the whole scene, blessing the event. And below him is the Holy Ghost in the form of the traditional white dove with here with outstretched arms also. And on either side of God the Father are supplicants who could be the apostles, though there are 14 and the apostles were, were 12. And maybe it could be St. Joseph and another figure. But um, it, it provides a sense of balance for the, for the upper register of the painting. And then on either side, flanking either side of the Virgin, are angels holding on to the throne upon which she sits. And then to the viewers, right or to the virgin's left would be a group of uh, musicians so this would be the escolonia the choir of boys that was traditional in catalonia and then to the viewers left would be uh, supplicant friars who are uh, looking up glancing at the virgin and then in terms of composition also it, we see a uh, the traditional pyramidal composition with a, a, a very solid foundation here and then tapering off like this, which was very typical of paintings in the High Renaissance. And the other sense of balance that we see would be that on either side of the Virgin of this central image here, we see two landscapes. One is evocative of Catalonia even though we see some birds that may be uh, 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 native to the Andeans. But this is mostly evocative to, to the viewers' right, uh, left-hand side, would be most evocative of Spain, of Catalonia, because it's showing the pilgrimage that is associated to the culture of the Virgin of Montserrat. And here we see, uh, uh, at the very bottom, we see a, a, a supplicant or a, a believer praying at the shrine. And then you see different people in, involved in, in the pilgrimage. And we see also it's dotted with like a few buildings and churches and, and crosses. But on the right-hand side of the viewer, we see a, a, a much different scenery. And what we see here is actually the very church of Chincheros, which uh, is very interesting. And, and this is where the painting resides to this day. And at the very top in the atrium, which is the outer part of the church, we see the procession celebrating the Corpus Christi, which is when Jesus Christ the, uh, becomes flesh uh, in, in the Catholic tradition. And in the main plaza, we see another congregation of indigenous peoples actually engaged in another activity, which I will explain in a second, because it is so significant to this idea of hybridity. And then a thought-provoking image as well appears 
above this scene over here in the Chincheros Church with, in the atrium in, in Plaza, which is uh, that two angels are using a saw to cut this mountain in the Andes. So they are engaged in the sawing, which is what Montserrat is about, and it is part of the iconography of this virgin. And incidentally also, well, it's not an accident, the child Christ as well, it's difficult to see it in this particular image, but he is also holding a saw, which is echoing. So it's, it's echoing this scene that is going here that we're let, let's discuss in now. So the concept of hybridity will become very useful as we analyze the painting in more depth. Okay, so I'm going to read from this seminal article by Carolyn Dean and Dana Libson, which uh, reads, hybridity is produced and enacted when particular kinds of things and practices are brought together that in some way challenge presumptive norms. Now, this article is very important in studying Latin American colonial art because it discusses all these complex aspects and helps us to, to see where, where we can go, we can move forward and how to understand it, it, all of these concepts in, in their complexity and the artworks and what we see. So basically what they're saying in this uh, quote and in, uh, generally in the article is that when we study the notion of hybridity, it's not necessarily particularly important where a style comes from, but how the combination produces something new and different. And then they say, the key issue centers, issues center upon two processes. Number one, and, and I've actually included these one and two to make it easier for, for you, is for us, is how the foreign and uncanny take on meaning through material objects and daily practices in colonial contexts. And this will become very important as we continue analyzing this painting, okay? And then number two, how interpreters living in the present choose to reckon with and reconstruct these contexts. So in this second phase, they are saying that there is a, a, a time element as well as a geographic one, right? Imagine an Inca noble in the 1650s. That person is creating hybrid art and that hybridity has at least two elements. One that has to do with geography and two that has to do with the time. It's a combination between a great pre-contact or Inca past combining with an Inca present that has to include the Spanish present, right? Another added element in this article would be also that, that, that this article evokes would be the added layer, of, to add another layer of complexity would be that we're, we in the 21st century, I'm, I'm recording this in March of 2020, so, we are also adding this, uh, we, we're also part of this time element, okay? And so uh, how we study hybridity also adds to this, um, you know, our interpretation uh, adds also to this notion of what is hybrid. Another aspect that we should emphasize would be the inclusion of architecture here. Some of this architecture, for example, this wall looks very dark in comparison to the scenery going on here. And actually, uh, let's have a look at the building itself. At first glance, once again, you see, oh, this is a very much of a colonial construction. But I'd like to point out that this particular wall was actually built not a, now the whole structure was mostly built by indigenous peoples. Uh, they had architecture before, obviously, and they had workers. Uh, so everyone in the community participated in building, in making this building, and actually commissioned the painting and all the art that you see outside and inside this church and this complex. Okay, but uh, what I want to emphasize is the fact that this is an actually a pre-contact 
construction. And in fact, the whole uh, building of the church was actually built on the royal estate of a Zapa Inca. And it would have been the 10th Zapa Inca, Tupac Inca Yupanqui. He was a brilliant general, and he's the one who actually built a, 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 a royal estate for himself and his, and his uh, Koya, his, his wife. And uh, that was demolished in the colonial period to make way for the Catholic Church that, is, that now stands in there. However, so this is actually very interesting in analyzing this idea of hybridity and mestizo or mixed styles. So is it indigenous or is it pre-Columbian? And it evokes these ideas of purity and, and what is authentic, etc. But in the colonial period, this becomes very complex. And for example, here you see a pre-contact Inca masonry. When you look at this, if, if, if you're familiar with Inca or Andean history, you would understand that this is actually an excellent example of local and native architecture. And then you will see the arch here, which was not native to this region. So you're seeing pre-contact and Christian or, or European side by side. And you can see that here with this beautiful uh, Inca wall in the front uh, and then behind it is this that seems to be European, though built with the resources and the knowledge and the work, uh, the, the work of indigenous peoples as well. You see this concept of hybridity very well exemplified in this particular painting, sometimes attributed to Luis Nino, or most scholars think is anonymous. It's called the Virgin of the Cerro Rico Potosí from the 1700s. It's an oil on canvas. Is so of European medium. And at first glance, the image evokes a, a, a Baroque, a, a Baroque art because it evokes some of the things that the Council of Trent of 1545 um, asked artists to do, which is that there has to be in art a depiction of religious subjects, including the life of the Virgin. It should be didactic in which you see a lot of elements, a profusion of elements here that teach. It must be realistic. So yes, this is not uh, abstract design, but it's very uh, realistic. And the message has to be very clear and it has to call believers into piety and have this aura of grandeur. So th there we see the Virgin Mary here once again being coronated by God the Father, Jesus Christ here, and the Holy Spirit in the form of a, a dove with the wings outstretched once again. The archangels, Michael and um, Gabriel, are on either side of the canvas as well. And then we see this breaking of glory in the center, which is clouds and, and small angels. And that means a, a separation between the celestial ambit and the terrestrial one. And over here we see Pope uh, Paul the the Third and Charles V, the King of Spain in the 1520s. And this is what's very interesting about this painting in the context of hybridity. It's a very much of a Baroque, a Latin American Baroque uh, because of the way of the composition, but also we see Andean themes. Here's Inca themes. For example, uh, the Virgin Mary is uh, the mountain personified. It's, it's an anthropomorphic uh, mountain, right? Because her head is just protruding on the, at the peak of this mountain. And uh, Apu, uh, which is a, a, a hill, is basically becomes a Virgin Mary. And also you see these two very important gods for the Andes, which are Inti and Kia, the sun and the moon. And in here you see a lot of the paths that the Inca had. The Inca were, are renowned for their thousands and thousands of kilometers of, of, um, of roads. So here you see many of the roads. They wouldn't be all here, but these are showing 
how they constructed in hills and hilltops. And you see also llamas and a horse, which signifies the presence of, of Europeans besides uh, the, the religious theme. And also here you see uh, a Sapa Inca, okay? Uh, what, Huayna Capac, who in 1462 discovered this mountain of Potosí, which gave so much precious metals to the Inca and later to the Spaniards. And also next to him would be a Waipa, who in 1544, according to Andean lore, he lost his llama and was looking for it in the mountains. Nightfall came, it was very cold, and he started a fire. And in the morning, a miracle occurred that from the mountain gave little ebbs, like little little threads of silver that had melted and had miraculously appeared before him. So that's very much of the Indian. And also uh, it, it evokes the way that the Virgin Mary is depicted here, uh, the mother earth who was Pachamama for the Andes. So let's see what themes to be Andean in this painting. Well, first of all, Apus, are associated with venerated mountains. We're, we're thought to, to, to hold the spirit, if you will, of that mountain. And also this specific site where this Inca royal estate was established and now became a church in the colonial period was also associated with Huaca, which is a special or unusual place or thing. Uh, and the concept emphasizes interrelations. The concept of place does not exist in a vacuum for the Andes from contact times until today. If you go to the Andes right now, you will see the interconnectedness of things. So there's always a mirror image, if you will, of, of, of one concept. So the waka was a special concept, but it did not exist on its own, but rather it was part of the landscape or the environment at large. So one of the themes that we see that is very much of the Andes would be this concept of Waka in this region and also that venerated mountain. The other thing that is very interesting is that we see two scenes here, one of the Corpus Christi and the other one of a very much Andean processional. In leading this procession, would be a local leader called the Curaca Cuna, or the Curaca for short. And let us study these concepts in greater detail it, because as uh, one of the world's leading experts on these paintings, Stella Nair has argued, is that what Chivantito was basically establishing in this part of the painting was the lack of interest, if you will, in, in one point dimension that is so prevalent in European art. And he's creating more of a more of a flat image to show these concepts that are very much Andean of the Hanan and Hurin, which are, are go back to this concept that I was trying to teach about uh, that there's always this mirror image of male, female, uh, dark and light, etc. So she says, Chivantito, Stellanair says, Chivantito successfully created multiple readings of this scene, enabling the Catholic faithful to read a sacred Christian procession, while the indigenous audience in Chinchero could view an image celebrating their own triumphal imperial Inca past. Let's have a closer look at these multiple readings. As I said, uh, like Stellanair argued, we see a flattening of this space to evoke this idea of the Hanan, which uh, occurs here in the atrium with the Christian or Spanish authority uh, safely in place, to juxtapose this or, or places side to side with a hurin, which is shown here in the plaza, plaza, the central plaza of, of uh, Chincheros, 
And here we see an indigenous celebration with uh, Kuraka leading the procession. And what becomes very important that Nair has suggested is that we see, for example, a group of musicians here holding musical instruments and sheet music, and they seem to be playing and, and echoing the, the musicians that are playing for the Virgin. In, in here, in this very scene, they seem to be playing mostly for the indigenous celebration going on in the Central Plaza. Rather, I mean, they are expecting the Corpus Christi, but they are playing in this space. Where the that the indigenous uh, uh, persons take, and the other interesting thing that Nair suggests is that this uh, the uh, the the fact that females are included in the painting is very significant because whereas the central figure is the Virgin, nowhere else in the painting do we see the female presence. All of the uh, people on the other side uh, of the painting that are uh, engaged in the pilgrimage, every single one is male. There's one indigenous person uh, who is a pilgrim there, but it's actually uh, all of them are male. And the only other person that is female would be the Virgin and then this woman over here. Nevertheless, in the Central Plaza within the indigenous celebration, uh, you cannot have uh, the the you cannot have only males and not females in this particular instance, and so you have that balancing act, and you see the strong presence of the females in this register, right here. So this is the only space right here, the indigenous space, where we see women engaged in important roles, uh, very powerful roles. In in, in fact. If you see, they're holding staffs, just like these other two men are holding, which is showing their status, their powerful status. And these powerful women, uh, the, the aspect that women are not marginalized, or uh, as Nair suggests, the European patriarchy is not shown here, is very much in keeping with pre-contact society in the Andes, where women could rule, officiate as priestesses even, and even own large estates or plots of land. And the other interesting thing is that, whereas the men have uh, adopted a lot of European uh, things in their clothing, for example, the shoes and the socks, uh, they nevertheless were the, the the traditional Inca tunic, but the women, in contrast, are dressed almost entirely in Andean fashion. In and that it would include, for example, the uh, the the dress would be the axu, which would be tied here with a chumpi, and also, more importantly, the yitlia which is this mantle worn on top, which is like a, a type of shawl, if you will, or, or mantle on top that would be tied with the uh, tipki over here, this pin. And a leading scholar on, on textiles, Elena Phipps says that this mantle was a hallmark of an Inca woman's identity. Its color, design, and patterning spoke to her position in society, including place of origin, region, clan, or the EU, and marital status. So therefore, uh, you see that the women are actually taking a, a specific role in uh, an indigenous celebration that is actually evoking an Inca status that precedes the arrival of the Spanish. The other thing that Nair emphasizes in this particular aspect of the painting is that the complementarity between these two scenes, there's a stark contrast in that this one is more blurry and less detail is shown here than in this one. And in that way, it, the, the indigenous space is made 
more prominent because of all the details and the and the fact that it's larger than the space in the atrium with the Corpus Christi. This calls it so calls our the the attention the viewers attention to this part, and in fact the elite men in here even with the name uh, written here, is actually even more prominent than even the priest officiating or leading this, the Corpus Christi. And the other thing is that a, a very important thing to keep in mind about the Andes is the idea of performance, of remembering via the objects. And we do that in this space via the women's clothing, for example, that are so entirely, almost entirely Andean. The fact that these other women are partaking in another ritual involving pottery, and pottery is so important also in the Andes. And in the backdrop of this spectacular wall that is part of the estate of the Sapa Inca. And so uh, this is a wall that instead of being destructed, was actually completed in the colonial period by the people of Chincheros. And so everything around here is helping these indigenous people to evoke uh, the, uh, the, that Inca past and that Inca present that they are remembering via the performance and the objects that they're using at this special time in this special place. And in the words of Tom and Cummins, uh, he writes, apropos of this very thought, there is a meeting ground in the Andes then between Europeans and Andean, but it is not in the text of documents, but in the customs and in the objects of tradition. These objects, operated in the Andean community in performative oral texts in which Curacas participated and linked a Curaca to his community and tradition. So there you have it. Via uh, the bringing of these objects, wearing of these elements, and in this particular plaza, in the backdrop of the Inca pre-contact wall, that is how the community and tradition was evoked, remembered, and preserved. And lastly, I'd like to discuss this scene in which two angels are sawing away at this mountain on the Andean side of the painting. And this is very thought-provoking because Chivantito took a Christian I, I, to Christian iconography and portrayed it in a distinctly Andean context. He specifically took the concept of sowing this mountain and put it in the local context. And by doing it, he's transferring meaning because as I said before, this apus was very sacred to the Andeans. And the, the sacred mountain you have two angels destroying the the apus, the sacred mountain, and this is the backdrop. And and, and this mountain is that does not live or, or appear in isolation, but it is part of the greater uh, Andean civilization at large. Right? Uh, it is in communication uh, and in association with things around it, including the people who have meaning for it. So you can interpret this as either the sewing away of uh, the Christianity of ancient traditions. Uh, is it a breakaway or is it a continuation? It's very open for interpretation on some levels. Apropos of these multiple interpretations, let's close by with this quote from Stella Nairs article. In the same way that Chivantito created a convergent reading in the town scene, he took the iconography of the Virgin of Montserrat, her sold mountain, 
and localized it. The saw and the mountain in the Chinchero landscape visualize and enact the destruction of the local sacred mountain by agents, by agents of the Christian God. In conclusion, this lecture covered, number one, the iconography of this painting, uh, which I have labeled here so that you can easily see that and remember. And number two, demonstrated the enormous creativity of indigenous artists working in colonial Latin America, which is a creativity that goes way beyond mere mimicry or copying. And number three, the lecture addressed what makes colonial Latin American art a hybrid that is both complex, significant, and actually, I hope, very enticing. Also, these are the works cited in order of appearance in the video and the credits. Thank you.